of the entire course because today we're going to look a little bit about how is that um, multi-body systems can be described in uh, three-dimensional space and um, as I mentioned last week, that it's kind of like just adding one more degree of degrees of freedom for a two-dimensional case for a planar case, but it's a little bit painful, and it's a, it's a little bit painful because the the rotation can take a place around three axes, and um, that fact is mathematically quite painful, and it's um, amazing that even today there are quite a bit of studies. Uh, journal articles, books, and uh, well, those are the, the ones that are recently published that are still in the field of uh, how to describe rotations in three-dimensional space. It's, uh, I mean, that, you know, some things are obvious and clear, like, you know, it's clear that the body can rotate in a three different ways. There's no doubt about that. But how to describe that mathematically, that is not so clear and there are still proposals how to make this uh, description to be more mathematically pleasant and how to make it more mathematically more efficient uh, that's a um, discussion that is still continuing it's not necessary because of the multi-body system dynamics but three-dimensional rotations spatial descriptions are very very important in, uh, in many many applications spatial space engineering is a um, Aerospace engineering, space engineering is a one example. And if you go to Amazon.com and you typed rotations, you're going to find that there is a huge amount of different kind of publications and books in available. So let me just uh, give an example to you. So I'm going to go to Amazon.com and uh, Amazon.com. So here I am, I'm going to type rotations. rotations and quaternions. Okay, so <clears throat> let me see. Okay, so just to give you an idea, so this is what I was able to find from Amazon.com. So there are books that are dealing with rotations and quaternions. What are these quaternions? That I'm about to explain to you today. So it's um, one way to describe the rotations, but you can see that, okay, there is a, this kind of a technology needed in a computer graphics, space engineering as shown in this figure here. And uh, I don't know what's an application here, but, uh, but anyways, rotations, quaternions, uh, double groups, quaternions. So, so quite a bit of stuff about this kind of rotations. And when you go to Google Scholar or other databases and check how much material is available about uh, how to describe the body rotations in three-dimensional space, that's a lot. That's a lot. So why this is still an open topic that I'm about to explain to you today. Okay, so that's about it. So um, as mentioned earlier, it will take a good part of, of today's lecture. It will take actually, to be honest, entire lecture today. There are, you know, some things that are is kind of like a top of the, the three-dimensional multi-body dynamics, which I definitely wanted to explain to you. And maybe you're interested, but still I wanted to give you that uh, that is information and it is related to robotics. Because robotics uh, is a very good application of multi-body system dynamics. So we're going to look at how the robot kinematics can be derived based on multi-body system dynamics. That, by the way, as I say that, you know, 3D multi-body will take a good part of today's lecture. These robotics, maybe half and half. We'll see. Okay. So then uh, what follows is way more pleasant topics because uh, once we're done with the three-dimensional space, that's where I try to start combining matters from vibration, fine attempt modeling, and so on and so forth. And we're going to first um, look at the introduction of flexible multi-body dynamics. Then we spend one week, which is two hours, in fine attempt method. So we're going to look at what is the inherent features of the fine attempt method. And I know that you may already have a good understanding about the fine attempt method, but 
I desperately wanted to explain what is my view to finance on the method because it might be a little different that you're used to deal with. And of course, it's just the one view, but I think it is important view which gives certain insight about what is a finite, met finite summer method and what's, what is a proper use of finite summer method. That is then is information we need when we are looking at the something that is called moderate reduction technique. Moderate reduction technique, which will be the last item prior to midterm exam, is a method which reduces the model, like the title implies. How that makes it possible and how to make it happen, that I'm going to explain it to you in the week seven. Okay, so um, summary about what we discussed last week. So we discussed shortly about how is a position of particle in three-dimensional space. And I can see that my face is a little bit of um, plucking the view. So let me see what would be the better location for me to, to put my head. Just a second, I need to put this to be visible. Oh, this is the way, not, not where I was. Okay, so particle, extremely important to understand that particle is very, very tiny dot, so tiny dot that you cannot find it in the real life. It is a mathematical quantity, and it's a mathematical quantity that is needed to describe dynamics. Okay, so particle is so small that it do not have a rotational decrease of freedom because it's so small that you cannot really differentiate if it is in this orientation or the other orientation. So the rotation is immaterial, okay? And what we wanted to do in a dynamics always is that we wanted to describe all the particles in the system with respect to reference coordinate system. And the reference coordinate system is typically the one that is called in common language as a global coordinate system. Typically, reference coordinate system is not moving. It is standing still. But it could be moving reference coordinate system as well, but typically in our case, it is standing still. Okay, so the challenge, this guy is attached to crown. So the challenge is to describe these tiny, tiny particles with respect to this coordinate system. And earlier we learned that the best way to make it happen is to use a body reference coordinate system. And the body reference coordinate system is the one that is shown here. It is attached to body. So it's following all the motion, translation and rotation of the body. So no matter what happens, body reference coordinate system always follows the body. So it's welded, it's attached, rigidly attached to body. Now, what we can then do with help of this body reference coordinate system is that we can describe all the particles within the boundaries of the body using the vector U bar. A vector U bar, because it's described with respect to body reference coordinate system, is always constant with respect to body reference coordinate system. So this is constant. It's not constant when you look at the vector U bar projection in the global coordinate system. And you can find that projection by using this guy here, which is a rotation matrix. It's three by three rotation matrix in a spatial case. And that is doing the miracle thing. So it's mapping the vector U bar to be vector U. Okay, so what is this thing? So what's the difference? The difference is this. U bar, bar here, indicates the fact that it's described with respect to body reference coordinate system. U refers to the fact that it's described with respect to global coordinate system. Okay, so that's it. The only thing need, that needs to be accounted in addition to that is the translation of the body reference coordinate system. And that's going to be described by using a vector R. So it all goes down with this equation that we are very much familiar with. Difficulties getting started when we are looking at this guy here. Three by three rotation matrix. And how is that can be described? Last week we learned that um, one straightforward way to do it is to use three successive rotations like is the case when using Euler angles. Problem is that whatever you're using three successive rotations or three parameters in general, you, that you're gonna have a mathematical difficulties some kind. 
mathematical difficulty may be the fact that you are capable to call the precision or configuration where you cannot differentiate what rotation is what. So it's singularity. Or you may face a situation that some of the components within this three by three matrix are something that you cannot compute. So it could be infinite divided by infinite or something like that. So it's always a difficult of some kind when you're using three parameters. And that's why today we are not going to use three parameters any longer, but we're going to use four parameters. Let me see how it well it goes to camera. So four parameters, four parameters. And still, I'm not saying that now the body can rotate in four different ways. No, the body can still rotate in three different ways, but four parameters are used because they are mathematically more pleasant than using three parameters. So it means that these four parameters have to be coupled. They have to be combined a certain way because they have to be tested three degrees of freedom or three free variables. So there must be four variables plus one constraint. What is this constraint? That's what, what we're gonna learn after a couple of minutes. Okay, but prior to that, um, this is short summary about what happened when using Euler angles. And Euler angles is very straightforward, simple way to describe this three by three rotation matrix. And as mentioned earlier, it's based on three successive rotations. First rotation, well, the sequence of rotation can vary, but Typically, your sequence of rotation is Z, where you first introduce the amount of rotation that was, hmm, what was this again? The last time there was a good instruction in a chat window, and I think it was phi, 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 isn't it? Isn't it not? Okay, so that amount of first rotation anyways will take a place around the Z axis. Then once we have a once rotated coordinate system, then we're going to introduce the um, rotation around X axis. That this rotation is, or amount of that rotation is theta. Now, no one is helping me today about these pronunciations. I just need to check it. Oh, okay, here it goes again. So that's good. I appreciate that. So phi, I think that I made a mistake. So phi, theta, psi. Anyway, so you see, you see this clearly. So this is what I'm referring as my first rotation. My second rotation takes a place around one rotated coordinate system and amount of that is theta. And then I've got to introduce one more rotation with respect to two times rotated coordinate system. And that one is then C, this guy here. So when taking, taking account the successive rotation, three by three rotation matrix looks like this. And here we're going to have a problem because it's possible that two axes of rotation becomes to be parallel. And then you're going to face the situation that is called gimbal locking, which is not a lock in traditional sense. So it's not a mechanical lock. So it's not that somebody is coming and introducing a lock to say a tire that is shown here, but it's inability to describe three rotations. And inability comes from the fact that two axes of rotation becomes to be parallel. So then you do not know what is what. And that's, that's the, this, this famous difficulty associated to Euler angles. I placed here a Wikipedia page, which says this one here. So it says that the Kimball lock is a loss of one decrease of freedom in three-dimensional tree Kimball mechanism. Kimball is referring to these axes here. That occurs when an axis of two out of three, of three gimbals are driven into parallel configuration. So that's exactly what I referred here. Put that in your brains because uh, this is something that I love to ask in our midterm exams. Okay, but let's move on. So let's. Let's leave the whole topics about the three parameters and uh, let's see what it means if we're going to have four parameters. And the four parameters or the mother of the methods based on four parameters is called Rodriguez equation. Rodriguez equation is, is, 
is something that we can use to derive other type of um, of rotation matrices that are based on four parameters, such like Euler parameters. And remember, the Euler angles and Euler parameters are not brothers; they are not relatives, even though that both have a name of Euler here. So they are completely different concepts. That's another thing that I love to ask because you know, typically people are making assumptions that Euler angles and Euler parameters are something like, I don't know, you know, relative some kind, and there is a certain clear relation between these two methods, the relation is not so clear. Good thing about whatever you're using three parameters is that they make it quite a bit of sense. I mean, the human is capable to easily to understand what these parameters are standing for. But whatever you're using four parameters, human brains are become to be a little bit off. It becomes to be a little bit too challenging for a human to understand what the rotation is supposed to be. But anyway, so we're speaking about the computer simulation, so in that perspective, it's not a big deal. Here is questions that I might ask in this subject matter. So, uh, like you can guess, um, uh, I might ask you to explain the concept of Rodriguez equation very often used. And I like to do it because the concept of the story is kind of nice. And then the concept of Euler angles, which you, you cannot explain it without knowing the concept of Euler equal, excuse me, Rodriguez equation. And then comes this more, I mean, the most difficult thing which we need to look at in a many different point of view, which is that in a three-dimensional case, a body orientation, body orientation can be defined using Euler angles, Euler parameters. Explain the concept of Euler angles and Euler parameters how these methods are different. Usability is one thing that like I mentioned. And I mean, human usability. So human can easily understand the difference between these two methods. But another thing is that, you know, one is suffering from mathematical difficulties, another one is not. Another one that is not suffering is Euler parameters. Finally, let's look at the erotic equation. So this one here is explaining the situation. So let me explain it to you. I need some uh, additional tools to be able to explain it to you. Okay, so uh, I need to make a setup here to be able to explain this to you. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, your vector here. So vector name is R bar here. R bar is the one that is showing here. Oh, excuse me, so it's going to be R, so I'm going to introduce the rotation in this direction. So I'm going to get started, this is R. This is my vector R here, all right? And I'm going to, I want to, what I wanted to do is I want to place this vector to be another orientation in the space. Like I get started here, hopefully it's clear, let me put it like this one. I want to get started here. I want to put it in another configuration like this. And now uh, what I really wanted to do is that I wanted to describe how the relation between the original and final configuration can be expressed. Final and initial configuration, how that relation can be expressed. Once I do know that, that's going to be my rotation matrix. So that's, that's it. So that's pretty much what I need. So I need to know this guy here, this delta r that is relating these two vectors together. So once I know delta r, that's about it. So components that I needed to solve this thing is of course, you know, my vector r, the, the one that I'm getting started. And then I'm going to introduce some uh, assisting tool here. Assisting tool is something that is playing extremely critical row. So my assisting tool is a unique vector v, this guy here, unique vector v that is attached to starting point of the vector r here. So the vector r can have any length you want, not limited. And then uh, in addition to that, I have this unique length vector. Unique length vector, you can, play, you can place that in a, any rotation that is needed to, to introduce this uh, configuration changed 
change that I'm after here. Okay, so here's my initial vector that I wanted to put in another configuration. And I'm gonna put this new, I mean, this vector, the new configuration with help of the unique vector V. Now the problem is that these pens are having the, roughly the same length. So it's not demonstrating well that this one here, this guy here is unit in a length, all right? So here's my configuration. What I will do next is that I will take a hold of this unit length vector and I'm going to rotate the whole system, which is now welded here. So they are welded in this location. There is no possibility that these two vectors can have a relative motion with respect to each other. So this is a system that consists of two vectors. So I'm going to take a hold of this vector V, which is a unit length vector, and I will introduce a rotation that the amount of rotation will be theta. This one here. Oh, okay, it's a little bit messy here, so let me take this off. This guy here. Ah, oh, this is theta here. And that's about it. Next is mathematics. And now comes already this, this thing that, okay, um, what's going to happen next? Okay, so I'm... I'm I will be able to express relation between my original vector and my final vector by using four parameters. And I see that I'm struggling with my camera. So let me wake up my cameras just a second. Yeah, remember um, in fall, I mentioned that I'm, I need to take, an, I need to purchase a new camera. I still haven't made it happen. And as I say, I have it already. You know, I have this uh, GoPro, but it's not yet connected to my my computer. Okay, so next weekend I need to take that seriously. I need to make it happen for you because it annoys me as well. And I would like to have a camera in another position. It would be, I would guess that I would look better that way. That's what I'm hoping. Okay, yeah, you guys, thanks for letting me know that the camera was not cooperating. Okay, so I'm, you know, here. Okay, again, no, no, it's okay. it's okay. it's it's back in operation. Okay, so um, so here's two things that I want to relate, R and R bar, those two vectors, and ingredients that I'm using to build this relation will be vector u bar and angle theta, and already, I would like you to know that these are going to be my four parameters. Then, now these four parameters will be obviously V, which consists of three components, because this is in a three-dimensional space. So it's going to be V1, V2, V3, plus angle theta. So those will be my parameters that I'm using to introduce the rotation. So one, two, three, four parameters. And... Uh, you may wonder, okay, where is this relation? So what, okay, sorry that I'm plucking the view a little bit. So this is my last parameters, theta here. So you may wonder like, okay, four parameters. So what is the one that is relating these? Uh, what is, you know, the constraint associated to here? The constraint is this. I put this in, put it in a writing because I'm going to ask this in, in class quiz. I might ask this in a written, you know, written exam and so on and so forth. So the constraint here is the fact that the vector v is unit in a length, in a length. Okay, what it means? It means that if I'm gonna compute v bar, it's me v1 power two plus v2 power two plus v3 power two, that need to be equal to one. This is gonna be my constraint. So these four parameters, they cannot move as they please. They can move in a way that fulfill this constraint. And that's going to be my constraint. So four parameters, but there's only three different ways that the body can rotate. Okay, put that in your notes because I will ask that in my in-class quiz momentarily. So let's move on. Okay, so this relation, this relation that I'm after here, this um, relation that is combining these two vectors is obviously this delta R and the delta R, I'm going to cut the corners first. 
the delta R can be expressed by using this assisting vectors B1 and B2, which is a perpendicular with respect to each other, B1 and B2, like shown here. They can be expressed like this. And once you do the math, once you make it everything clear, rotation matrix look like this. Okay. So I wanted to cut the corners because what happens next is by far most unpleasant situation or lecture in your lifetime so far. Uh, okay, so the camera is again not working. <clears throat> Let me see what I can do for the camera. I don't know if the camera is that important, but I guess it is because, you know, I'm using my hands. Because it is okay to keep it on. And I'm back. Thank you for letting me know this. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was about to explain that, okay. This is what I'm going to get. That's a final result. But if you really want to derive this mathematically, that's going to be um, hmm, involving. It's going to be nightmare, to put it, you know, short. And why it's going to be nightmare? Because that's simply because you need to define the B1 and B2. First, you need to define their direction and their length. And it's not going to be pleasant. That's going to be involving quite a bit of mathematical operation. I will show it how to make it happen. But for sure, I'm not expecting you to be capable to do it by yourself. What I'm asking, however, is that you have to be aware of the concept. And the concept, again, is that you have original vector. And then you take an assisting vector V, which is unit in length. You attach that assisting vector to your original vector, you can take a hold of the unit vector and you can introduce the rotation and the amount of rotation is theta. When you're using parameters of this unit length vector plus angle theta, that's going to give you the expression of rotation matrix that is based on four parameters, but these four parameters are not capable to move as they please because there is a one constraint that is limiting these these parameters and the constraints come from the fact that this one here this vector v is unit in a length that's where it's coming from okay so this is how it finally look like and maybe you're not familiar with the certain notations so uh this guy here is skew symmetric form of vector v what is the skew symmetric form? I'm going to explain that to you in a second. But that's going to be the final outcome. How you can get this final outcome? And I'm going to speed up a little bit because this is the stuff that I'm not explaining you to know in details. So you can get that by computing the vector B1. Here is a B1 and B2. That's how they are shown. B1 and B2 by using algebra. So using algebra, oh, let me see if that can make it. No, 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 not that. Come on. Guess if this is. Hmm. Okay, so I guess that this is not perfect, but it do the job. Okay, so I'm going to use algebra to, to define um, length, their length, and their direction. And in a direction and a length, you know, when you're making the rotation where this is a starting point and this is a final point where the rotation start and ends, you know, you can make a circular shape around these two points. And when you're measuring the radius of this circle, that's what the A is standing for. And now you just uh, figure it out what is uh, the length, and that's going to be a cross product of vector V and vector r bar and the direction the same story again you can use a you know vector v and vector u bar and take a cross product of that and when you take that in a unit in a unit length that's going to be your direction once you combine this information that's how your b vector b1 vector excuse me look like and again because i'm not expecting you to master this stuff i'm going to call this through fairly fast same holds for B2, which is this guy here, B2. Again, you first define the length, 
And again, you're using the radius here to make it happen. Uh, once you're using certain amount of mathematical manipulation, you get this as the length and the direction you can get it, uh, you know, the similar way. This is going to be the direction. So this is going to be your B2 vector. Now, once you're combining everything together, this is how it look. And this is how it look. And, uh, you know, the skew symmetric form that was available a couple slides back. And I see that uh, I see my camera is no good. So this is not the good camera day today. Hmm. Why is not the good camera? Oh, I, I'm back. I'm back. I see that there are just a certain delays. Oh, okay. So how to? Okay. So there's a question. Sorry that I missed the question. So how you? How do you choose the assisting vector direction? Okay, that's an extremely good question because remember that what I'm aiming here, what my is my my whole purpose of this 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 case is to, to change the configuration of my original vector to be such that it started here and it ends up in such to be here. So you select the direction of vector V is such the way that you can make it happen. So you're selecting in a way that, you know, this one here, when you look at this radius, when you make the radius from the final, the last point, you make vector V to be such that it is crossing the origin of this radius. That's the way it could happen. So it's a case dependent. So it's depending where is what kind of rotation you want to introduce. But again, not easy to understand the concept. Not at all easy. But it's related to where is that you wanted to rotate your vector. That's my answer. Awesome question, by the way. Okay, here's, uh, here's the deal. If you ask a question that I'm getting very confused and I'm, you felt that I'm unable to answer the question in a satisfactory way, I'm going to give you 14 points, not 14, 13 points out of the in-class quizzes. 13, one tree, one tree points from the in-class quizzes, meaning that if you can answer one more in-class quiz correctly, you will get this upgrade in your final grade. Quite, a, quite an offer, I would say, quite an offer, because think about it. You just think about something that you feel that is extremely, extremely difficult. You place the question to your chat window, and if I'm unable to answer, jackpot, 13 points, and you will get an upgrade to your final grade. Use this opportunity. This is going to be a great opportunity. If I would be you, I would be searching the literature and asking something that something that makes me confused. And remember, there's a lot of opportunities. So it's not just this lecture, but many, many others. So you have a lot of opportunities. Okay. Uh, I got a bit confused. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so here. So um, I think that I was explaining about this Q-symmetric thing. No, I don't remember that clearly. I think that I was explaining something that, that I clearly remember, but what was it? that I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, so um, skew symmetric is often used mathematical notation, which is a way to re-express or express the cross product in a little bit of different way. It's typically used when you have a lot of manipulation because cross product manipulation is, is a, not so handy. So it makes more sense to express the cross product in a way that the first component that you have in a cross product, you will express it in a way of a matrix. And the matrix is simply denoted in a way that there is a this symbol, tilde symbol. I'm not sure if it is tilde. I think it is tilde symbol in the top of the first symbol. What that's standing for? It is standing for the fact that you take the components of your vector, you do no thinking, absolutely no thinking. Uh, you relocate these components of your original vector to three by three matrix in such the way that, you know, let's get started here. The first component goes here and it goes here. But when it goes here, you add it here minus sign. No thinking, just do it, just do it. And then you take a second component 
you relocate, you relocate this component or put this component to be here and here. And when you put it here, you add it here, minus sign front of it. Final one, it's going to go here, minus sign front of it, and then here. And what you can see here is the diagonal of this final product is having the zero values and orthogonal components is having the skew symmetric, skew symmetric form. Skew symmetric in a way that, you know, A1 here is located here and here, here is just a minus sign. A2 is located here and here, here is minus sign. And A1 is here and here, here it is in minus sign. That's what is called skew symmetric form. So this final product here could be expressed in a way that is sine theta, v, skew symmetric form multiplied by vector u bar. Sorry that this is not so clear writing. So this is v plus sine power two, v skew symmetric, u skew symmetric, r bar. Okay, so we can do a bit more manipulation for that. So this is how it was expressed. And finally, when I uh, do this manipulation, so I take this v the skew symmetric part here, power two, my final product looked like this. That's going to be my rotation matrix. Rotation matrix. And it's doing the rotation, as title is saying. Okay, and again, look at the components that I have. V consists of three components, V1, V2, V3, and angle theta. Those are my four parameters, and uh, that's about it. Okay, wake up, because I'm about to ask this in-class quiz, which simply is saying, okay, where is the thing that combines or relates these four parameters together? So here it is, so three variables in V, one variable in theta, four variables in total. Constraint is the fact that this guy here, V is unit in a length, unit in a length. Okay, so let's see if in class quiz is next. Oh, not yet, but I'm about, you know, it's, you see that it's getting harder all the time, so I'm about, about to ask that to you. Okay, so here is my constraint. This is what I already explained to you. So four parameters, one constraint, that means that there's a three different ways that the body can rotate. Okay, and here's my in-class squeeze. Uh, let me put it active. My in-class squeeze, let me read it to you in a second. I just need to find it out where is my browser. Here it is. Okay, I see that three students already entered the answer. I, it seems that I have 41 students. That's amazing. Must be a mistake because I can see that I have 28 students that are following the stream. Yeah, and game is on. Place your guess. What is the success rate? My personal guess is this. That's right, 90. That's what I'm guessing by myself, 90. And the reason being that, you know, if you if you didn't follow my explanation, there would be absolutely no way to enter the correct answer. No way to do it, no way. But if you followed my, my explanation, which I'm hoping that say roughly 90% of you are doing so, yeah, of course you can guess what is the correct answer. Okay, so um, let me read it to you. Interactive quiz equation, the one we just looked at, rotation is described by four parameters. V1, V2, V3, and angle theta. These four parameters are coupled because rotation theta is small, because vector V is unit in the length. We are assuming a body to be rigid. And the final one is the parameters are not coupled because a body can rotate in a four different ways. Those are the choices, and uh, let me see. 17 students already entered the answer. How come I'm this slow? I can see that I already have four minutes to one o'clock. Extremely slow today. Another thing that I'm uh, hoping you to do, which is a worth of one 
in class point is that if you feel that I'm slow, just type comment to chat window which says speed up, speed up. Don't, you know, explain it in uh, too much in details. Okay, how to enter the quiz. So the way you can enter the quiz is that you log into Socrates website, which is, um, uh, well, Socrative.com and you use your student ID number. I don't know how to find your student ID number. I think that somebody last week mentioned that you can get your student ID number from CISO uh, system, this one. How to find that? I guess that you just need to Google LUT and CISO. Maybe you can find it there. That's uh, or you can send an email to student affairs office, and for sure they will tell you what their your student ID. Is. Oh, in CISO profile. That's that's uh, somebody mentioned that. Thank you. So you log into CISO using your student ID. Uh, I don't know your account information, and then you should be able to find it there. Okay, so I have 20 answers in my class quiz, and it look at there is a 41 students in the system, which I doubt. I don't think it is that many. I don't. I don't believe it. 28 are following the stream. Now let me see if the number is a little bit different. No, it's 28. Okay, so I'm about to close this one because. You never know, you might score 100% and you know what that means. You score 100%, I'm gonna give you one extra point because of community effort, because we're all doing so well, because that makes me so happy. And uh, now if you guessed that it's 100%, so you can gain a total of three points. Okay, last week I got one winner. I need to find my notes. Where's my notes about the winners? Here, yeah. okay. So, you guys ready to see how is a uh, results? Okay, let me make this a bit smaller, like this. And uh, now we're gonna close the lottery game. Oh, hold on, hold on. Lottery game, and we're gonna see how is a success rate. So results. Look at this. Look at this. Check, you know, check, you know, I'm, you know, I'm kind of happy and also a little bit uh, disappointed. And uh, I'm happy because, you know, guess what? I guessed this correctly. Check this, check my, uh, my message from the chat window. I just need to double check that. Yes. Yes, it's me. So I, I placed there 90 and success rate was exactly 90. And uh, um, then other choices. I mean, the the ninety percent of you selected this correctly, which is great. Which is great. It's not hundred percent. It would be awesome to have this not hundred percent, but it's okay. And then some of you selected okay, it's uh, because we are assuming body to be rigid. Nothing to do with this business. Nothing to do with that. Really, very much incorrect answer would be to select that the prom, you know, the D option, which says that the party can rotate in a four different ways. That's going to be completely off completely off. Um, this makes no sense because, you know, we never mention anything about the magnitude of the angle theta. And also, um, yeah, we're dealing with the rigid bodies, but this is the rigid bodies are not related to this subject matter this time. Okay. Euler parameters will be next. Um, let me see if there's a, I need to scroll down to see what are the latest comments okay so you are looking at the student id number so it's seven digits seven digits okay okay Euler parameters and then we uh, we're ready to move on Euler parameters is a is heavily related to Rodriguez equation and it's actually kind of the same thing in uh, Euler parameters, we're gonna simply start calling the parameters that are used in a little bit of different names. And to that end, I'm gonna introduce this 
trigonometric relation to my rotigraz equation. And once I do that, you know, this is how my rotation matrix looks like. So no thinking so far. It's just, uh, it just, you know, the way to uh, look at things in a little bit of different way. So no particular reason so far. Then next one is important, which again, I'm not expecting you to memorize this, but it's uh, one thing that is needed to, to start using the Euler parameters. So I'm calling these parameters that are used in this equation by certain names. So I kind of give them name tag. And the name tag goes such the way that uh, theta zero will be the one that is cosine theta divided by two. All right. So it's a name tag, nothing else. Theta one is vector v one. I mean, the component of vector v, the first component of vector v, multiplied by cos, excuse me, sine theta divided by two. The second one is almost the same, but this time I'm looking at the vector v component two. And the final one is component three. So I'm giving these name tags. And the names are here theta one, excuse me, theta zero, theta one, theta two, theta three. That's it. And once I'm using these name tags, once I'm calling these names where that is shown here, I'm going to get the rotation matrix that is shown in this way. And that's going to be my rotation matrix based on Euler parameters. I guess it all becomes clear to you now that Euler parameters are these, let me take this mess away. <clears throat> are these four parameters like shown here. These four parameters are Euler parameters. And again, we're using four parameters, not three, but four. And uh, this is, uh, you know, the one that I remember when we look at the Amazon.com, you know, we look at that, the, there was a books about quaternions and rotations. So um, to cut the corners a little bit, something that is enough for you to know is that when, when you're using these four parameters, you're going to family of quaternions, which is a kind of like own mathematics. And the quaternions is uh, having certain particular ways to manipulate the mathematics. But for you, this time is enough that when you're using four parameters, you're kind of using the method that is according to that category of quaternions. And that's the mathematically efficient way to describe the rotations. Why this is efficient? Well, that's simply because whenever you're using these four parameters, you do not suffer from singularities. You can do whatever you want. You can place your rotation as you as you want, and you're gonna have no mathematical difficulties in a form of locking or in a form of other difficulties that makes it difficult to compute these parameters. That's it. So if you look at the engines, game engines that are used at the moment, and uh, multi-body engines that are used at the moment, they typically using Euler parameters or other methods that are using four parameters in the description of body rotation in the engine. But because for human, it's so difficult to understand what is the deal with these four parameters. Usually the user interfaces are built in a way that you can place your body rotation and body configuration, system configuration by using Euler angles or any other means so that is using three parameters. But once it goes to engine itself, once you start doing the computation itself, then you do the mapping from three to four parameters. And that's simply because once you have a four parameters, then everything is gonna be smooth and efficient. And you just need to make sure that you have this one constraint. But in a multi-body system dynamics, we have the constraint anyway. So it's not gonna be a major headache. Okay, Euler angles is expressed here. Euler angles, when you're using the Euler angles, the variables are these four parameters, like uh, you probably guessed already. And the constraint associated with this is same, is physically same than what we used in the Rotterdam equation. So it's still going to be this vector V that is inherently, or is kind of hidden inside of these four parameters. This needs to be unit in length. And you can express that by using Euler parameters like this same physical 
origin. OK, so with that, I, uh, because I realized that I need to speed up a little bit because robot kinematics is my next thing that I would like to explain it to you. Uh, prior to that, just shortly, a little bit about what are the properties of rotation matrix. Not going to take too long time because we already know pretty much all these properties. We know that uh, rotation matrix is orthogonal, meaning that you know it's describing the axis of coordinate system, Cartesian coordinate system, and these coordinate systems are perpendicular with respect to each other. And these, you know, these coordinate axes are unit in length, which is not needed in a, in a, to make system to be orthogonal. But once you create the rotation matrix, such that let's say x gonna be here, the first column, y gonna be the second column, z gonna be the third column, you know, it's gonna be orthogonal. So it's meaning that if you're gonna take a transpose of the matrix, it's equal than inverse. That's a great benefit. Benefit. And the, what this means, actually, transpose inverse, is meaning that you're changing the mapping order from global to local, because initially it's local to global. Okay, so um, this is pretty much what I just explained. You can verify this by playing with the uh, Rodriguez equation and deriving it backwards so you can get started from the origin, excuse me, the final destination and come back to origin and you recognize that, you know, what happened is this, is it just a transpose operation? And that's gonna be equal then inverse. Okay, and I uh, also mentioned earlier that in three-dimensional space, the order of rotation is something you cannot change. You cannot do that. And you can make an experiment easily by taking a box-shaped body and rotate that first by x-axis and then y-axis, and do the same by using y first and then x, and it will have a different final configuration. So that's about my properties of rotation matrix, robot kinematics. And I think that this is gonna take me another, I don't know, 25 minutes to explain this to you. Maybe not even that much. And then, uh, then we're gonna look at this final thing that are related to how is that we can relate angular velocity and time derivatives of uh, generalized coordinates. So this is gonna be the really the key thing. And I know this is like, okay, come on, but do I need to know this? Well, it's something that is extremely important whenever you're dealing anything in three-dimensional space. Why is that? Because this relation that comes in a play, which I already kind of tell you, that's gonna be related by matrix G, then this G here plays extremely important roles in many, many different details in three-dimensional dynamics. That's that's reason why we wanted to learn this G matrix. Okay. Okay, so some of you are still struggling to lock into Socrates. Hopefully you're able to do it because then other Socrates will be in will be available momentarily. Okay. So robot kinematics. Two questions. Um how to use four by four matrix representation in robot kinematics. That I will explain you in the very beginning. So it's an alternative for kinematics that we are used to deal with. So remember in the kinematics we're doing is this one. In three dimensional space. Okay, so um, so there is a message that uh, somebody answered that Socrative after deadline. Is it possible to answer after deadline? I don't know. Oh yeah, I see that it's possible. So I somehow need to, you know, I need to play with the system sets that you cannot come and uh, enter your answer late because you know, it makes no sense. If you know the answer, then you place your answer. You know, that's, that's no good. So it's no fun in the game anymore. Okay, but I was here explaining this stuff. So that's what we use in a multi-body dynamics. So this guy consists of three components. 
this is three by three. This is component of three. Yeah, so I know that you, you guys are still discussing about the socket event. This is, you know, I need to find a way to close this gate. Because otherwise I'm gonna get no answers on time and then later you will place your answers and where's the fun? No fun anymore. <clears throat> okay, four by four. Idea in a four by four is shortly to combine translation and rotation in a one package. One package. Here originally they have three, I mean the, the dimensions are clear three components, three by three, three components. And now once I combine them in a one package, it's gonna be four by four matrix representation. I'm typically, for some reason, not very, very often in a midterm exam asking how to make this four by four matrix representation. So pay attention to what I'm about to explain to you because it's simple concept. And if you have no idea, if you haven't heard about that before, then you will be, there will be no way to answer that correctly. And then we're gonna use one specific method that I'm, that I'm sure you have heard before. So we're gonna look at the method called Denavit Hartenberg four by four matrix representation. As an example, how to use these four by four matrices. <clears throat> okay. Robot kinematics, what we could do in a robot kinematics is that when we have a, this kind of robot that is consisting of um, revolute joints, I can, I can actually find it out the configuration of the end here by using the concept of successive rotations. So I can describe this joint by rotation matrix, this joint by rotation matrix, this joint by rotation matrix, and my final configuration we can get by using a successive rotations meaning that uh, each one of these sub rotations or joints to be more specific will be simply multiplied together and that's pretty much what is needed. Now the big question or the big kind of the problem in uh, robot kinematics is that we do know where the end point need to be located. Let's, let's go back here. So we know that the end point need to be here, this particular position in this particular orientation. And the question is, how to select the joint parameters such that you can reach this position and configuration? And that's gonna be something that is called inverse kinematics. So you know what you want, but you don't know how you can get what you want. And the parameters you can play with are, of course, these joints these joints that you can put the joints to, well, to, uh, to configuration that is possible with um, physical limitations. So that's what you can play with. A uh, typical scenario in robot kinematics is a uh, typical thing related to robot kinematics is that robots are redundant, meaning that they can reach the point and configuration by number of different ways. Good example about the redundant system is me. You know, I can I can you know point this pen using this configuration, but I can point the pen by using this configuration as well. I can point the pen by using this configuration and this configuration. So there's a lot of different possibilities, and I could keep this here, and I could just you know rotate my elbow, and uh, that's it. I'm redundant system, so I can reach this point by number of different ways. How that is possible? Because I have so many joints. I have so many joints that I have this freedom and, I, and, I, and then I have big brains too. And the big brains are needed because, you know, it needs some computing to figure it out how you can reach the configuration. So joints, I mean, a lot of joints to be able to, exp uh, to get this configuration in a number of different ways. Uh, that's something that gives us a freedom of choice. So there's a many different ways you can make it happen. What's the most efficient? That's typically the question in a, in a robot kinematics and it's called redundant kinematics. And I, by the way, I can see that for some reason, my, my slides are a little bit in a weird configuration. So let me see if I can make it look a bit better. Hmm. 
No. Well, it is what it is. <clears throat> okay, so put that in a framework of multi-body system dynamics. Question is this, that we do know this guy here, so we know where the end point is supposed to be. But we do not know where the body reference coordinate system is supposed to be. I mean, it's translation and we don't know its rotations. So those are the things that we need to select. Okay, so um, as mentioned here, robot is redundant if an endpoint can be obtained with a number of different ways. That's, um, and that's typically most of the robotics, so most of the robot configuration and solutions are made in a way that they are redundant. So now let me ask you, uh, okay, let me see where my Quain class quiz is coming. Huh. Oh, okay, for some reason I am missing the my in class quiz here. Okay, I'm going to save it to next week and I'm going to tell you already that I will ask you to tell me whether or not this double pendulum, if it would be a robotic, is a redundant system or not. We could discuss this shortly. So do you guys think that this is a redundant system, meaning that can you reach this point, this particular point, with respect to this coordinate system using one configuration or two configurations? You can place there. Let me let me see what is your answer. So can you please uh, say that it is uh, redundant? I mean, my question is, is it redundant? And the answer is yes, it is redundant. No, it's not redundant. So those are the two choices. So let me see if we have a communication. I guess we don't communicate today. Oh yeah. So the first is is redundant. Any other opinions? Okay, so yeah, okay. It's redundant. And it's redundant because, you know, think about the number of degrees of freedom. So it can can reach this configuration, you know, I have two bodies. So remember from the, the fall, so I have, so if using the uh, planner explanation, I have six generalized coordinates, then I have here one and two revel joints. So two constraints, so it's two degrees of freedom. So I can reach this configuration this way and this way. So it's redundant. So which one to select? Yeah, that's uh, that's the question of re redundancy. And this is a question of, uh, of uh, inverse kinematics. Okay, sorry, this is gonna be next week. So I promise it's gonna be next week. So just put this in your memory. And next week, you're gonna get one extra point. And remember this, um, Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a, a question. Sorry that I forget that. So is there, there was a question, is there some kind of constraint like floor or, or similar that prevents the system to go this configuration? No, no, there's no floor, no floor. Okay. Um, and remember this offer about difficult questions, something that makes me confused is worth of 13, one, three points, one, three points. Think about it. If I would be you, I would do the literature review by asking, you know, looking at something extremely difficult and get back to next week lecture by asking something extremely hard. So this is challenge to me as well. Now, you know, what I'm here to explain, sorry that I'm, again, going the wrong direction, but it's your responsibility too. So as soon as I started to discuss about something weird, send me a message via chat window that Aki, wake up get back to the topic and speed up. Okay, <clears throat> now what we're gonna do in robot kinematics is that we're gonna reorganize this representation, this kinematic representation. It's very simple, so it's very straightforward. So we're gonna reorganize this in a way that, you know, remember in originally the equation was written like this. No thinking, we're just gonna take this 
tree by tree rotation matrix and located that in a new matrix to its upper left corner. So this is going to be tree by tree sub matrix in my four by four matrix. Just, just do it. And then you're going to take this one here that is describing the translation. You take it off from the original equation and you place the four by four matrix representation such that it will be located in the upper right corner. What is left? So far, I have three rows, four columns. So this is not very good because it's not uh, a skier matrix, so it's going to be a little hard to deal with. So let's add here one more row. And one more row is simply the row where I'm matching the dimensions. So it's going to be zero components and the final component, which sometimes is weirdly called as a scaling number. We don't want to scale anything here. So we just wanted to keep the scaling to be equal to zero. And that's it. Now you're going to get the four by four matrix representation. So what is this doing for you then? It is accounting the translation and rotation simultaneously. And in a robotics, that is sometimes the case. I'm just uh, twisting myself such that you can see that uh, what I have put it in a writing here. OK, so let's say that uh, you have a coordinate system, which typically would be a body in your robotic. And in this body, you have here a point, And you would like to know where this point is with respect to this reference coordinate system. And this one here is a vector described with respect to this uh, coordinate system. So four by four matrix representation accounts the translation and rotation of this rotation for the coordinate system. And you could get its final configuration by simply multiplying B is that's the way that you're adding here one uh, scaling factor or the number that makes sure that the dimension match. And then you could get the final configuration. That's it. Okay, is this any good? Well, it is some good, so it makes sense, sense to use it. Here's an example. You know, this is a, a little bit of a boring example, but it uh, explains that I have coordination B here, which is this one here. The coordination is rotated 90 degrees. And then there is a, the coordination is also translated 10 units along the x-axis and y5 units along the y-axis. And these are referring to this global coordinate system. <clears throat> so tell me where this point is located at when the, the P1 here is provided in my question. So not too difficult. You just uh, do the rotation matrix using any means you want. Maybe the easiest this time is to use Euler angles because um, you know, this is a rotation is around the global Z axis. So this is going to be your solution of rotation matrix. Then you're placing the information about the translation here and here to this place. And then you're matching the dimension. This one here, you put it just here. If you do the math, that's it. No thinking. Very straightforward. Very straightforward. Okay. But how this is in a robotics? So is it making any sense to use in a robotics? Well, yeah, it actually makes quite a bit of sense because in robotics, there could be joints that are allowing relative translation and relative rotations. So those are the two things we can tackle by using this four by four matrix representation. And you can build the kinematics, well, as shown in this example. So you can you can build the relation between the vector, excuse me, the rot coordinate system U and coordinate system D. In such the way that you do this a four by four matrix representation and you're traveling from U to A and A to D. So you're using this in a pretty much similar way than successive rotation. You're building the four by four matrix representation for each one of the body members of the robotics. And once you get this uh, representation, then you're just multiplying these together. And that's going to be your final configuration. So that's the purpose. That's the concept behind, the idea behind. You see that you can reach this D coordinate system by another way too. So you can 
travel here from U to B, which is four by four matrix representation, B to C, another four by four, and C to D. So that's how it goes. So let's make this to be a bit more practical, a bit more useful. And this is where, I'm, where we're gonna start looking at the method that is called Denovit Hartenberg method. But the concept, this four by four matrix representation concept is this summary. You take these components that we used in a multi-body system dynamics and you relocate them um, like this way. I don't know if this is clear representation or not, but the final solution is four by four. And this original rotation matrix will be located in upper left corner. Translation will be located in upper right corner. That's it. And then you can use these bodies that are connected together using this technique. How it goes in practice, that's what we're going to practice uh, next. That's what we're going to exercise next. Okay. Um, in a robot kinematics, you know, typically there are just a few uh, kinds of joints that are used in robotics. Uh, so if that's the case, maybe what we can do here is that if these are the components that are used in my 4x4 rotation matrix, maybe some of the components could be fixed and not allow them to move freely. That would mean that, you know, if originally uh, this one here is Rx, Ry, Rz, and this guy here consists of three or four parameters. Let's say that it consists, consists of three parameters like this. I can actually provide some initial information to some of the parameters, uh, leaving just a few of the parameters to be open or free to change their numerical values. And that's going to be the way to build the kinematic representation of robotics in a very efficient and very fast way. So there are many different ways to make it happen in reality, but I think we need, just need to learn the one. And the one we're going to learn today is going to be called this Denovit Hartenberg rotations. Okay, these are the typical joints used in my robotics. So uh, you can find cylindrical joints, rebel joints, translational joints. In cylindrical joints, there is a two ways that there could be relative rotation between neighboring bodies. They could be this rotation like this and this kind of rotation. Let me see if it is clear. This, this rotation and this rotation. Rebel joint is only like this. And translational joint there's only the, this relative uh, translational motion. Now, what we're going to do next is that we can represent the different joints by locking all other parameters except the ones that are used in the joint itself. And that's going to be a fast way to build the kinematics. So it's going to be very, very efficient, fast way to build the kinematics for typical robotics. So, and the method we're going to use is called this denovit hartenberg which is based on four parameters, four parameters, four different kind of parameters. So we're looking at the four relative ways how bodies can translate with respect to each other. And that's pretty much that is all needed. All right. So let's see what are these four parameters. So first parameter <coughs> or first two parameters will be called as a, a which is a length of the body. So it's just the length of a body like shown here. And then I have here the one that is associated to length, which is how much there is an angle theta. An angle theta here is that if you have a length here, how much if there's a rotation, I mean the revolution here, another revolution here, how they are rotated with respect to each other. Hopefully it's, let me see here. So this is uh, when the angle alpha is zero. This is where the angle alpha is getting to be bigger and bigger. Okay, so those are my two parameters. Another two parameters <coughs> is a D, which is showing the translation associated to cylindrical joint and angle theta that is two associated to 
Oh, hold on, hold on. Rebel joint or cylindrical joint. I was in this slide here. So D here is showing the translation angle. Theta is showing the relative rotation between the neighboring bodies. What happens next is that we go back to this uh, four by four matrix representation. And based on these parameters, we're setting most of them to be equal to zero. Actually, out of the four parameters, five will be set to be equal to zero. The only one that is left to be non-zero will be the parameter that is expressed in this technique, this denovit hartenberg technique. Okay, here's an example. First, we're going to look at this length. This one here. Yeah, that one. So it was correct. <clears throat> length. So we can look at the length. Okay, so it means... Hold on, there have to be a mistake here. So did I skip something? Oh, no, 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 there's no, no mistake, no mistake here, because, okay, so length is the first thing. So how that is associated to rotations? No relation. So it's a, those rotations are all zero. How that is related to this Rx? That's it. So that's exactly my parameter. So that's what I'm going to set to be A. Rest will be zero. And once I submit that information, you know, these parameters, to my four by four representation, this is how it look. All right, makes sense. And remember how I got it? I got it in this way. So this is gonna be my four by four matrix representation. And as you can see here clearly, this sub matrix here is based on Euler angles. Okay, next guy, this angle alpha. Angle alpha, that is uh, this one here, this twisting how they're twisted. Okay, so it's affecting to this theta component, nothing else than the theta component. Rest will be equal to zero. And once this information is submitted to my, I mean, this equation, this is gonna be my final solution. All right, moving along, I'm moving ahead. So then the D, the D is associated to this parameter here. Again, the rest will be equal to zero. And once submitting this set of parameters here, this is how it look. Final one, this is my set of parameters. And this time is this guy that is changing here. And when I substitute it here, this is how it look. Finally, of course, you know what's gonna happen next. I'm gonna take each one of these components into account. And when I take each one of these components into account, I simply multiply these matrices together like this. This is going to be my final 4x4 four four matrix representation based on denovit hartenberg method. Okay, so how this is making your life any different? This equation, as it is shown here, is not going to make your life any different. So you need to be still capable to use it. But using it is not so difficult. The using is actually fairly straightforward. Because what you need to do in real life is that you need to select these four parameters. Once you have these parameters, then you can get the kinematics, kinematics automatic. You see, um, I still have a time to explain that to you. So here's how it is. So looking, you're looking at these parameters from your robotics. Once you have the parameters, then you get the kinematics. No thinking needed. And again. Remember again, if there's no thinking, that's going to be my favorite method. And here, not exactly my favorite because you need a little bit of thinking, but no, I mean, limited amount of thinking. So it's okay. It's okay. All right. So I'm going to give you an example how to use this method. Here's in my example. So I have, again, this double pendulum, which is a simple robotic system. Uh, it consists of two bodies. Body one, this guy, and body two. And what follows is that I'm going to build the table. 
And in this table, I'm going to have each many, I mean, as many rows that I have number of bodies in my system. So this time, two bodies in the system. So here's going to be my rows. <coughs> Excuse me. Then, then there will be uh, four columns. And these four columns will be associated to my four parameters. Four parameters that are these dynamic Hartenberg parameters. And the only difficulty here is to select what these parameters are supposed to be. And to be honest, here it is simple to select, but there are cases that it's not so simple to select it anymore. But basically, this is uh, still the, the core of the method. You build this table. Once you have the table, that's it. Then you get the kinematics automatically. Okay, let's look at in this case, the first parameter, which is a length of the body. Do we have a length <coughs> of the body? Or so is that the body number one? We do. We do have that. How much is that? That's going to be the one that is mentioned here. So it's going to be L1. Then do we have any twisting here? Twisting. Remember, like, if it would be, hopefully this is clear like this. Are there going to be any twisting like this? No, because it's a planar system. Second parameter will be zero. So what about, are there going to be any motion like, let me try to make it clear, like motion like this, which is the parameter D. Any motion like this in a system? No, that's not the case here. So the D is here, zero. And then the second, the final one, what about the relative orientation between the first body and the ground? Yes, there is going to be relative translation, and that's going to be this guy here. Then the second body, we're going to do the same. Length, yes, there is a length. The length is coming here. You know, there is no uh, twisting here. There is no D here. And there is this angle, theta 2, which is a relative coordinate this time, relative coordinate. So it's a little bit of different concept than in uh, multi-body system dynamics, because in multi-body system dynamics, we would always look at the global coordinates. How is an orientation with respect to global coordinate system? Here, we're looking at the relative coordinate, you know, how they are rotating with respect to each other. Okay, so now I have my matrix table, perhaps, maybe a better way to say table ready <clears throat> what's going to happen next i'm going to go ahead and uh, substitute this this row to my four by four matrix this row to my four by four matrix and my final kinematics i can get by by multiplying these matrices together that's it this is telling me where the endpoint is located these two guys remember that this is now a simplified to be planar case. These are associated to rotations. Okay, that's how it works. This is called. And here's what I'm doing the same thing. You know, I'm using the relative coordinates here. I'm doing the same thing by using a multi-body system dynamics. <clears throat> so I'm not using the multi-body system dynamics the exactly the same way that you used to deal with. But I'm first going to this body. And from the this body, I'm substituting the information for the second body. And that's going to be like, finally, I'm going to get the relative coordinates. And once you look at the results obtaining by using more conventional multi-body dynamics, it's exactly the same than based on 4 by 4 rotation matrix. What do you think? Good to know. Good to know. Good to know. Okay, so that's about it except that there is still a little bit about how is, uh, what's the deal with the um, three-dimensional multi-body dynamics, because we still, you know, the question or subject matter that is still open is this thing, angular velocity, t, theta, dot. And again, why, why is such a big deal about this? Yeah, because of this guy, because this allows you to do the mapping for any parameters you want. 
this <laughs> this plays a quite critical role in in dynamics now uh, it's particularly important when we're looking at the inertia properties so here's what i'm question i'm not going to open this topic any further from that but this is what i'm gonna or might ask in a midterm exam is how inertia tensor can be related to acceleration of rotation of generalized rotational coordinates oh my god what a question so this is a so if you would be able to answer that right away that will be a big deal this is a long story to be able to answer that which we can open next week wednesday just shortly i see that i have only a couple minutes left today but i want to open this a little bit so you can get an idea already like what's going to happen next okay what's what will happen next is that we're going to take our three-dimensional uh, kinematics, which is business as usual. So we're gonna take this equation. Oh, hold on, so it's not the clear writing, but this equation. We're gonna differentiate that with respect to time. We will get velocity. And that's where we're gonna stop because the velocity is something that we will get angular velocity. An angular velocity is something that needs to be a little bit of thinking like what that is actually standing for us and what that means for us. And, <clears throat> you know, that um, this one here, this angular velocity like it is expressed here is not yet related to generalized coordinates. And I want to relate that to generalized coordinates. So there's going to be a short story about that. I would say 20 minutes next week. And then we're going to do something else. And there's something else we're going to do is going to be flexible things. And that is then related to vibration, that kind of stuff. That's what follows. Now, <clears throat> with that, I'm going to close today's streaming. But hold on, hold on. There's some one more important thing to say. So I'm going to close the streaming and recording. And... Um, Right after that, I will send you an email. And in that email, I'm going to send you a calendar invitation to team session. Team session will be the, exactly the same team session that we were last week. So if you still have a link somewhere in your folder, you may use that. For me, it would take two minutes to log into Teams. And why to go to Teams? Well, of course, we would like to go to Teams because maybe there's some more interaction from your end to ask some questions, make some comments. So, so see you in a bit. And uh, if you are able to join the team session, I will see you on next Wednesday, where we're going to close this stuff about three dimensional rotations. And we open the topic of flexible multibody dynamics. All right. See you later.